welcome to episode 39 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today we're joined by Mark Stevens. Hey, Mark. Hi, good afternoon. How hey. are you doing? I'm very good. Yourself? I'm doing all right. Is it afternoon already? Yeah, it's just, it's it's just, ticked, it's just over. ticked over <laughs> midday. You're on it. You're on it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for inviting me up to your home. Uh, to do a recording for your episode Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm really excited to wait and hear what you've got to say about your time in the military but but how are you doing today? No very good very excited to um, be doing this with you today Um, yeah been been a long time sort of in the process sorting it out hasn't it but it's um, it's, uh, yeah no really looking forward to it yeah Yeah. we're here now and uh, it is a bit of a warm warm day so yes. there is a, a few windows bit. open. There is, yes. So <laughs> if there's noise outside, we'll see what the editing can do, but uh, we'll do our best. <laughs> All right. Well, Mark, as uh, previous episodes, we mm. have the four questions, mm-hmm. um, which is the summary of what we're going to go into for, for your main episode. Yeah. So I'm going to say them one at a time for yourself, okay. and then we'll dive into the, the main part of the show. Okay. So the first question is, uh, when did you join? Uh, as a fresh-faced 16-year-old lad straight out of school, September the 5th, 1990. Wow, 1990. Okay, yeah. so right on the, the 90s. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, and then the next question is, what service and branch? Uh, Army, Royal Engineers. Cool. So British Army, which yes. everybody could tell by your accent, of course. But <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Royal Engineers, which is yes. w- where we've got that great connection. Absolutely. So yeah. we'll see what that chat sounds like. Um, and then uh, how long did you serve for? Uh, I did 23 years in total. 23 yeah. nice length of time yeah and then the last question is what rank did you get to uh corporal corporal perfect all right mark well let's let's rewind the clock shall we uh, so yeah. where was you born and where did you grow up so i was born just down the road actually down in fairham okay um and my parents owned a petrol station at wickham which is just down the road as well um mum and dad run that until i was about seven years old um and then we moved up the road to a place called Gretham, just north of Petersfield, right next to Longmore Army Camp, if you know okay. that. Yeah. Um, and did the rest of my growing up there, actually, before I went off to the Chepstow to okay. do my apprenticeship All right. to join the Army. But yeah. So for people that aren't aware of the UK relevance, it, yes. it's south, south London or south of London yeah, in it's, England. It's, it's Hampshire, so it's sort of... Uh, Central South Coast yeah. of the UK. So it's, it's I suppose, north, it's north of Southampton that people might have heard of Southampton. Yeah, yeah Southampton's a, sort of to the west of us, southwest of us. Okay. Portsmouth's to the southeast of us. All right, and so you're kind of in between. Uh, yeah, and Winchester's to the north, so we're slap bang in the middle of those three cities, actually, nice. in the countryside. There yeah. you go, there you go. Yeah. Um, so it sounded like you did a bit of moving around when you were young. Um, how how did that affect kind of school and and academic side of things? Yeah, I mean, I was only seven when we moved up the road. My brother was five, so um, yeah, I'd I'd started primary school, but you know, um, it wasn't really a big change to be honest. Okay, you know, because just into another primary school. Obviously, you have to make new friends and stuff like that, don't you? But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There was there wasn't really a big shock to the system i wouldn't say really you, you, you know it's not like i'm a pads brat we're moving every couple of years right, yeah, you know yeah. or whatever with a posting or whatever but it was yeah it was it was fine it you were really. fine with it yeah. yeah um was there anything you were pretty good at at school with with that being education or or, or sports <laughs> um yeah i mean sort of secondary school um I was a bit of an average student. Um, at the end of my primary school, uh, I was diagnosed as dyslexic. Okay. Um, I can't do it now, but I used to write mirror writing all the time. So that's how it was discovered was, you know, teacher would write, ask you to write a story and I'd write it. And, it, you know, I think I've write it perfectly. And it's, you know, teacher can't read it until she held it out to a mirror. Really? And I was like, how the hell does he do that? So, yeah, often get tested properly and stuff like okay. that. Diagnosed dyslexic. So wow. that was the age of nine. Um, but, I mean, that was the 80s where, you know, dyslexia was 
not understood, you know, by yeah. teachers and by schools and things. So, um, yeah, I didn't really enjoy my secondary school career so much. Okay. You know, um, because of that. Because of that. Some of the some of the treatment that I got from teachers. Right. You know, it was just treated like the dummy. Okay. You know, not oh he's dyslexic, he's thick, you know, that sort of thing, which was um quite prevalent back in the back in the day. I, thankfully we're a bit more sort of understanding of the condition now and it it doesn't mean that you're stupid or thick in any mm. way at all you just wired up a little bit differently to everybody else really yeah yeah you know but um but yeah no mum and dad paid for additional schooling for me english lessons at a private school that i had to go to a couple of times a week um for several years um that helped quite a lot um gave me coping mechanisms and being able to understand the condition and be able to deal with it and you know, not let it affect me really. Okay. Um, to be honest, I use it. It's, it's 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 always been quite a driver to me. You know, um, especially because you know people tend to think, oh, he's dyslexic, he's thick. You know, I've always had that at the back of my head, but I know I'm not. So I use that as a motivator to prove that I'm not. Okay. You know? Yeah. So, and yeah. did you find that, I mean, <clears throat> don't go into detail here, but did <clears throat> you find that that was in the back of your mind, like you said, when mm. it came to joining the military and stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so, also, while I was at school, I was a army cadet. Oh, um, okay. I was in the yep. ACF, in the local ACF. Um, joined up as soon as I could when I was 13, because I look really good and really appealing to me um but sort of the late 90s um and knocking on towards 1990 i mean it's quite a difficult period to get jobs especially coming out of school and stuff like that um i knew i wasn't gonna get to go to college because my grades were not good enough to progress you know um further education right um you know, coming back to the dyslexia, you just put into the lower groups. So the grades I got at school were the maximum I could have possibly got. So weren't enough for further education, but was enough to join the army, you know. And first went along to the careers office. I think I was 15, dragged my mum up there. I want to join the army, you know, um, and the first thing she said when she got in there to the to the recruiter was, I don't mind him joining the army, but whatever he does, he needs a trade. That's good of her. You know? Yeah. Um, I think she always wanted me to be a plumber, to be honest. but um, <laughs> <laughs> To help she, around the house. She, I think so, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she knows plumbers make good money. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. so... Um, so you did the... You do all the tests at the careers office. Um, and I think this was before the barb test, which is, I think they do it now on computer screens or whatever, don't they? Um, this was pen and paper. You know? Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, no, past that, got good marks on that. Um, so that opened up um, quite a few choices okay. of trades and um, cores that I could have joined. That's good. And ju just, just on that, what what was the enticement to, to join the military and also the Army Cadets? You said that it looked fun and looked good, but was it someone in your family that gave you that enticement? Um, no, not really. I mean, um, my grandfather served in the Royal Navy during the war. Right. Um, I had an uncle who uh, served in the Army. He was... Uh, he was PACOR back then, which is now AGC. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have any family connections no. that okay. pushed me that way or wanted right. me to go that way. You know, I wasn't really following in anybody's footsteps. But because you enjoy cadets, you but thought... Because I enjoy cadets and, you know, I, I also, you know, we, we lived right next to Longmore Army Camp pretty much and the... 
and the training area that's up there, you know, with rangers and all that sort of stuff. So it appealed to me, really, you okay. know, because I grew up with it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Always had army coming in and out of the shop that were on exercise or whatever, you know. Um, we used to go up to the camp and sell papers and sweets and God knows what in the canteens and stuff like that. So it sort of seemed logical that I wanted to join the army. I think I always wanted to join the army since I was the AI anyway, you know. Fair enough. Um, and like you said, you then had a big list of areas in the army you could join. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but because you do well on the test, it opens up more. It gives you more choice, doesn't it? You know, um, so I could have, I could have picked pretty much any trades in the Royal Engineers, um, and the Remi. I think there's only a couple of things that I couldn't do, um, like aircraft technician and, you know, those high level sort of trades. Um, but I was always also interested in, um, like an engineering. I wanted to do something engineering wise with metal. You know, um, so I plumbed for fabricator. Well, back then it was welder or sheet metal worker, you know, right. which is now um, in the core is uh, fabricator. Um, so that appealed to me as well as a trade. Um, looking back, I think I could have probably picked better because, you or know, like plumbing, like plumbing, <laughs> <laughs> get my mum happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, in hindsight, you know, even though I really enjoyed that trade training and on my apprenticeship and my class one, it, I never really got used. Right. You know, whereas trades like carpenter, carpenter, uh, bricklayers, you know, surveyors, they get used quite a lot. Yeah. On yeah, yeah. on tasks and things like that. Um, whereas sheet metal work and fabrication, I think I did two jobs in total. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Joining that, you decide what you want to do. Yes. And then you obviously have to head off to, to basic training. Yes. Uh, so so how did you find basic training and, and whereabouts did you, did you do that? So, um, yeah, so 5th of September 1990, um, dropped off at List train station. Mum was on the station on the <laughs> waving flags on me as I got on the train. Oh, really? And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was quite funny. But yeah, no, was, and, and and got the train up to Chepstow. Um, and that was to the Army Apprentices College at Chepstow, which no longer exists. Right. right. Um, it's still a barracks. Um, okay. I think the Irish Guards, the Irish Guards were in there. I don't know if they are anymore, but it's still there. It's, um, uh, if you don't know, the Chepstow camp is right underneath the Seven Bridge. Right. Which is between it, Wales and England, right? Yeah. So, so the, the old Seven Bridge, so the M48 Bridge. Um, so it's right underneath there. But So that's where I did my yeah. basic training. Really enjoyed it. Um, ten weeks. Uh, we quickly got whittled down, though. I think it was the same on any basic training. Uh, I think there was like nearly 50 of us started in our troop on um, basic training, and we ended up with... 28 i think something like that 27 right. 28 okay in our troop um but no really enjoyed it um did you excel at anything good. or is it just getting through it and... uh i think it was just getting through it you know i wasn't a star performer i was quite i think i was sort of above average in the troop but right you know i wasn't the, a star performer um i was just sort of you know got across everything pretty well really but to be honest cadets. but Helped yeah, <laughs> I, that's definitely helped, you know, um, definitely helped with a drill and yeah, stuff like that, yeah. you know, because um, I was sort of already used to it a little bit. Um, shooting, I was fairly good at. Again, it, probably from cadets. Probably right? from cadets yeah. as well. <laughs> but yeah, no, was, uh, no, I enjoyed my basic. And then um, it's just a normal basic training first 10 weeks, you're there. And then you finish that, have you passed an in parade? So you, all your family come up, you have a big parade, you know, uh, for your passing in parade. And then um, you have like a week or two leave and then uh, you start your trade training at Chepstow. So it's a, it's a, it was an apprenticeship. So I was actually there for two years. Right, okay. 
So that that you, I think you mentioned it doesn't. It's not there as an apprentice place. No. Now, no. but what w- what was the idea behind that? That you were young enough so you could do education. Is it is it kind yeah. of like a Harrogate or yeah, it, it, exactly? It's, is it's it? Harrogate replaced Chepstow. Right. Oh, did it? Okay. So okay. um. So when I joined up, obviously we had the apprentice college at Chepstow, and you had the junior leaders down at Dover. Ah, right. Um. But they closed Dover while I was still at Chepstow, moved all the junior leaders in at Chepstow as well. Um, and then a couple of years later, after I left Chepstow, um, that was closed and then they opened up Harrogate for the apprentices. So um, though they do it slightly different now with Harrogate because I think Harrogate's all that education and mm. military training and all that side of things. Yeah. And then they go down to Chatham to do their trade afterwards, right? Whereas... When I was at Chepstow, you do your basic training, then you start your trade training. But in between, you're doing your trade training. You're also doing military training, so you're also doing the ranges, you're doing exercises, all that sort of stuff as well, you know, uh, as well as your education as well. Right. And then after that, where do you go off to next? Is there more training? So, yes. So um, after after we finish at Chepstow... Um, went off to Gibraltar Barracks at Minley to right. do our um, B3 combat engineer. Um, and that was after you'd been at Chepstow for two years? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Bloody hell. Okay. Yeah. So um, I know the instructors at Gibraltar Barracks used to hate when they had the Chepstow intake come through because you'd have 200 blokes turn up, 200 apprentices turn up to do B3. So all the B3s were all apprentices pretty right. much you know with the odd adult recruit sprinkled in here or there into the troops you know yeah but um because we'd already been in for two years you know so we've already sort of got over that initial basic training f- phase shock if you like yeah um and started to become a bit more relaxed and adult and, you know as you do after you get to your unit sort of thing. Um, I know the instructors at Jib Barracks hated that. <laughs> yeah. You know, absolutely thrashed us, you know. So, but, you know, I, I think when I left there, after my B3, I was probably the fittest I've ever been in my life. <laughs> you know, I could run a BFT in under eight minutes, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, it's... um, Even though it was a hard, hard sort of three months there doing the B3. I've, I I did quite enjoy it, you know, learned quite a lot. That's good. Yeah. And then for people that aren't aware, the B3 is the combat engineer side of things. Ba- basic combat basic engineering. Combat, and yeah. yeah, you learn probably so, every, everything to do with engineering, really, don't you? Yeah, so it's all, all your field fort into all your trenches and all that sort of stuff. Uh, minefields we did back then. I don't know if they do those anymore. Yeah, they, well, I, again, I, I went through 20-odd years ago. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they did still yeah. did do it, yeah, in um, the sand area. But back... Back then, we had anti-personnel mines as well to learn about, yeah. which are now gone, thankfully. Um, because it was bar mines as well when I was going bar through Bar mines, yeah, yeah. Bar mines. Um, and we had the old Mark Seven round metal mines as well. Yeah. Um, what else do we have? Uh, well, there's watermanship. So, watermanship, explosive demolition, bridge mm-hmm. building, yeah. uh, building roads and airfields, and all that sort of stuff as well. You know, proper yeah, good combat and like, water supply. But that isn't stuff. that weird because you've essentially done your trade training yes, and then you go in there to do basic because when, and again, it might have been different from the 90s to when I went through in the early 2000s, mm. but that was basic everything. So we did basic chipping, basic bricklaying, basic, all of that kind of stuff. So we've got a very, very basic understanding yes. of every trade pretty much. And then you went off to, they then went off to Chatham mm-hmm. to do f- their trade training mm-hmm. The drivers went off to, to Leckenfield to do their driver training. Yes. Um, so did you have to go through some of the basic quals as well? Or is it not so much like that? No, not so much like that because you've done all your basic stuff at Chepstow. Right. Right. So you do all your basic training. Um, then you do your trade training. You've got a bit of military training in there as well. Um, and then you have a big final exercise before you leave Chepstow called the Train Soldiers Carder. Oh, really? Okay. Um, which is like a two-week-long exercise up in lovely Sunnybridge. 
Which, uh, yeah, in fact, we had quite a few exercises up in on Sunny Bridge while we were there because it's just up the road from Chepstow. So, um, and that's South Wales, isn't it? That's South Wales, yeah. yeah. Which rains, oh, apparently it rains a lot. Apart from that TSE card ride, didn't it? It was like, well, like yesterday when it was red hot, and those, right. you know, but oh, ma- mainly it's major. rainy, <laughs> mainly it's very rainy. But I think that's the only time I've been there and it's been dry, <laughs> right? Right, right. You know, but mainly it's very rainy up there, yeah. But, um, so yeah, that pass out, so or pass, final, final exercise, final exercise, pass out of Chepstow, and then you go off and do your combat engineer B3 okay. course at Gibraltar Barracks, and then you're off to unit after that, right? So, did you back <clears> then because what year, what year would this be? 92? 92, yeah, 92. So, when I went through Jib Barracks, yes, we did a final little exercise to showcase. To the parents, what we've been doing. Yes. No. So we do. It was a water water landing yeah, on the they, boats. They, and... they still do those. Yeah. Yeah, they still do those. <laughs> but yeah. you, they didn't do that with you. No, we didn't right, do that. Right. No. No. Uh, no. Yeah, it's just interesting. Laying laying the. Uh, well. What, yeah. No. The beat class the, class thirty. Yeah, because I, I I mean nowadays, uh, and I think probably since when you went through, they do a pass off, which is like you come across Hawley Lake and the boats. You know, do a bit of a fighting attack or something, don't you? I you see. know, then come retreat back across the lake, and then you know, it's get keeping your stable belts and your TRFs and your, and then uh, breakfast with a CO or something, isn't it? You know, at yeah. the end of it, you know, sometimes you get parents there, but yeah, so um, but yeah, there's didn't have any of that when I went right, through my right, B3. Right. Okay, was, okay, yeah, you know, you've passed now, Christmas leave, and then off to unit. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> So you've done two years in the army. Well, two two and a bit years, nearly two and a half years, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you actually finally get to go to your first unit. Yes. So uh, yes. Where, where was that? So that was 2-2 Engineer Regiment at Perham Down, just outside Tidworth in Wiltshire. Um, so, yeah, I turned up there straight after Christmas leave. Um, went into uh, Sixth Squadron, which is the HQ Squadron, um, when I first turned up got put in the resources troops so i was like counting stores all day and that sort of thing um but also at that time so sort of that this was early 1993 um five squadron were based in Isahone in germany and they were moved back to tidworth so it was always part of the plan i was only going to be in six squadron for a couple of months until Five squadron turned up, and I'll be off to be fair numbers up. So five squadron came back, went across to five squadron, got put on my four three two course to get my H license, my tracks license. Okay, so that was uh, an army personnel carrier, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, yeah me- oh, mechanical okay. royal engineers live in four three twos, pretty much. You know, so um. Yeah, did the driving course for that, then across the five squadron and then into a mechanised um, engineer squadron. Um, so it's just to, uh, doing combat engineering out of the back of a 432 pretty much, you know, which is, I really enjoyed. Yeah, how long was you there for? Um, so I spent six and a half years at Tidworth. Wow, okay. So um, in, in the same... In five squadron. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, so... Um, Got promoted there to Lance Corporal. I was about 97. Um, and I was posted off to Germany in spring of 1999. Right, right. So um, <clears throat> out to Hamel. Okay. Which yeah. I believe you know. I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you went out there in 99? Yes. Okay. Um, and what, what squadron? And what, what was the regiment when you got out there? That was 3-5 uh, Engineer yes, Regiment. 3-5 Engineer. Yes. Right. So... Right. Um, at the time, there was two regiments in Hamel. Um, so there was 3-5 and there was 2-8 Amphibious, which you were part of, weren't you? I was part of that, yeah. Yeah. Um, later on, obviously. Two a, years later. A little, little, <laughs> little bit later on. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went out to 3-5 um, and I drove out there in my own car um, and I literally had a post-it with the notes on for the directions 
Yeah. Yeah. You want to go to this town, this town, this town, this town, then you get to Hamel. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, well before sat navs or anything like that. You yeah, know? yeah. So, yeah. No, managed to find my way to Hamel, okay. And then um, I spent about an hour and a half driving around Hamel looking for wire fences, looking for the camp. You know, and then I found a wire fence. I just followed it around to the front <laughs> gate. <laughs> but it's good. Um, Before you carry on with about uh, three yes, five, um, yes. your six and a half years um, in Tidworth. Yes. Was that all just pretty much exercise? Because I'm guessing in the 90s. It no, wasn't... no, no, not quite. No, um, no. Did you go away with them? Yes. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry, I skipped over that a little bit. So, um, went out to Canada. Once. I did Canada. I did okay. Canada. Did a exercise in Cyprus. Um, was, uh, oh, an exercise in Cyprus. Yeah, so not, yeah. not not at all. Um, Line Sun. So we was out there for. Um, they used to ho- hold these exercises yearly in Cyprus. So it was a dismounted exercise. Um, I was out there for about two months or so, mm-hmm. three months. Um, but it's February March time. We went out there. And um, we're all thinking, oh, Cyprus is going to be lovely weather. It's in the meds, you know, get, get work on our suntans and all this sort of thing. <sighs> Waterproofs, don't need to take that. Don't need to take uh. that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've ever been to Cyprus, or if anyone's ever been to Cyprus, some of the heaviest rain I've ever seen in my life was in Cyprus. And literally none of us had waterproof gear with us. <laughs> <laughs> so Fantastic. that was quite funny you know doing a stand two of an evening heaven's open and all you can hear across the harbour area is people laughing because they're absolutely soaked through <laughs> and it was either a choice of either laugh or cry you know so, but it's yeah no cyprus was quite good fun um any other locations uh so we did canada did bosnia twice actually while i was there Okay. So skipped over that. That was a big one to skip over, isn't it? So, so that's two operational tours. Two operational tours. Okay. Um, so the first one was Grapple Four, um, and that was uh, that was nineteen ninety four. Um, so that was literally straight after Cyprus. We went out to Bosnia, right? For six. How months. did you find that? Because I've heard different stories, mixed stories about Bosnia. That was um, yeah. I mean, I was 19, I was young, I was dumb, you know, a little bit excited about being in a place that was a little bit dodgy, you know, as you are at that age. Um, but looking back, I mean, it's, it was it was okay, you know. Um, but some bits were a little bit shocking, you know. Um, so there was one job we went out to... Mount Igman, just outside Sarajevo. Um, just a section of us were sent up there to support the infantry. Um, and we were just told, oh, you need to help reinforce the buildings they're using uh, for an OP, uh, looking out across the mountains, across the valleys, to see what the Serbs and that were doing on the on the far side. Uh, we turn up, and the camp that we have to go to was the um where they held the ski jumps for the olympics okay. in 1986 yeah but you know so like the where the podium was where people were given their medals and stuff like that there's lots of bullet holes oh, wow. and stuff like that because i think people were executed there and mm. that sort of thing so that was a little bit shocking i was, I was probably to say you know um and then we went out up the mountains the next day Right, you need to refurb these two old, like, I would say they're like shepherd's shacks sort of things, right? So they were like round houses, um, stone walls that were probably about three foot high, and then just slotted, it sort of, you know, wooden roofs, pointing up into circular wooden roofs. And so we had to prop and shore those, right? And... Do you remember saying, "Well, if we get mortar attacked and you get a direct hit here, the only thing that's going to be left standing is our propping and shoring." Oh, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> the rest of the building was that. Wow. You know, probably been up there for hundreds of years and just you know been repaired now and again. You know that sort yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, but um, but 
actually, while we was doing that one, um, Kate Aidy turned up. Do you know Kate Aidy? No. So, but then Kate Aidy's a famous uh, war correspondent for the BBC. Right. Okay. Um, and it was notor. She was notorious. If ever she turned up, you know, the, you knew there was trouble following. You know, because she'd only go to the hot spots where she could get the best stories and all this sort of thing, which is fair enough. That's her job as a journalist, right? As a war correspondent. So she she turned up. Um, everyone posed for a photo with her at the end of the day and all this sort of thing. And then the next day we went further up the mountain and we had to do some proper insuring to support the roof of this old school building or it's an old brick building anyway. And uh, that was working under sniper fire. So the, the Serbs were shooting us while we're oh, carrying right. out, carrying these great big blocks of timbers to do the prop and insuring <laughs> to, put, to put in this. And, um, but we had the, I think it was a Cheshire's, pretty sure it was a Cheshire's, um, sat there with a couple of warriors and they just decided to open up on an old trench that they knew was over the other side of the valley. Funny enough, a sniper fire stopped oh. shortly after that. You know, I uh, sort of scared them off. But yeah, but it's um, yeah, that was an interesting little experience. So the warrior tanks helped you out there. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that's just that was just a weird day, you know. <laughs> it was just a really weird day, but um, interesting, interesting memory, I think. But yeah, um, rest of the tour was fairly sort of benign really it was little mo most of the time we were filling in potholes on the main supply routes um and we fill them with concrete but obviously you know concrete takes a few hours to go off properly doesn't it so you go out fill these potholes with concrete go back into camp come back out the next day and you the plan is to go further up and then do the next puddles along. But you come along, find all the local kids or the locals have dug out all the concrete oh, no. from these puddles. Oh, yeah. right? Okay. Uh, uh, that was down Route Triangle, I believe it was. Um, but it was an area called Bonbon Alley, right? Um, so the kids loved the puddles because we drive along in the back of the old four tunners or the eight tunners. Um, They'd be asking for bomb, 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 mate, hey, Mister Bomb, 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 bomb. You know, trying to get sweets and chocolate and God knows what out of us. You know, so they wanted the potholes there because it slowed us right down, so they could scrounge mm. of us, right? Clever, yeah. You know, um, or if they hadn't dug it out, what you'd find is somebody's driven through it and it splattered everywhere. You know, uh, so we decided to get some of the old concrete. You know, the motorway barriers, the big the yeah. big ones yeah. that they use as dividers. So we had some of those, got some of those from somewhere. We even painted them up bright yellow with triangles on, you know, for arrows, point them, point them around. So we do the puddle, fill it with concrete, level it all off nicely, put one of these barriers either side. Next morning we came up, there's a old, old like Mark's, Mark one Volkswagen Golf smashed into the because <laughs> 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 they all thought these barriers are oh, they're all plastic would just drive through them sort of thing you know it's just mad over there and, it's concrete. Uh, and, they, <laughs> and it was a concrete one <laughs> so he trashed his car but yeah Jeez. But that was that was mostly what we did out there really was you know okay. repairing potholes out on the main supply routes to keep the vehicles so yeah, that, yeah. you know supplies moving. What about your second tour? Was it was it similar? Or? <clears throat> yeah. Um, and when was that? That was a little bit different. So that was Grapple 7. So actually, from getting back from Grapple 4, Grapple 7 was about 10 months. Oh, right. Okay. So, so not, 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 not too not, long at all. Not too long at all, really. Um, but this time, um, we was based up the roads in a place called Gorny for Kouf, um, in the in the factory there. Um Again, we was we was doing sort of engineering tasks to improve the MSRs or repair the MSRs and um, 
I was doing troop commander's driver there, so I was driving around all over the place, you know. Um, but also that tour was that was the last United Nations tour, uh, which the grapples were. They were all under United Nations, so we had the blueberries. Oh right, the, so even your first one was under the blueberry. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. But at Christmas, that's when it changed from United Nations to NATO. So it changed from Grapple Grapple Seven into I four one. It was called, right? The tour, yeah. Um, so, yeah, in a mad panic, in well, not really in a mad panic, but um, we quickly had to paint all our vehicles because they were all white with UN on the side. Yeah, you know, I had to paint them DPM. Oh, really? Yeah, literally <laughs> overnight. But it was like end of November, start of December. And um, Bosnia at that time of year is cold. <laughs> you know, so you tried to paint these vehicles in those conditions. You know, it's just horrific. It was bad, but yeah. It's, uh, but yeah. So we had um, there was bridges we was trying to repair. You know, we put um, LSB in across bridges that had been blown up by the combatants out there. You know, um, so lots of little engineering tasks like that. Um. Yeah. Again, that was it. But we saw more of the um because we start because we changed over to NATO. We had to push further up country. Um. So we saw more of the ethnic cleansing that was going on and stuff like that. So that right. was that was a bit nasty. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you just drive past villages and because they're random over, they're setting light to them to get them. Yeah. You know? But all all sides were doing that, you know, out in Bosnia. Um, yeah, just so I bet that tour had a different feel. Yes, yeah, one. yeah. No, it was a little bit more. Um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say it was it for us. It wasn't more kinetic or anything like that. You know, we were still out going out and about doing um, military engineering jobs. You know, building bridges and repairing roads and all that sort of thing um but there was definitely we definitely saw a lot more of what the combatants out there were doing to each other you know um so yeah some of the ethnic cleansing stuff was a bit you know you just drive past you see whole villages on fire you know all this sort of thing because they want to get rid of them and stuff you know and so you couldn't do anything about it, so you can't do anything about it. No, I'm guessing frustrating or yeah, a- yeah. angry maybe, perhaps. Mm. Don't know what 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 was it like when you? F- I when think you were more out there? frustrating. Yeah. Um, because you can't do anything about it. You know, you can't go and step in the middle of them. Or, I wouldn't so say it angered me. Definitely frustrated me. Um. But yeah, it definitely opened up the eyes of what people are capable of. Yeah, you know, okay, in, in those sorts of situations, you know. Yeah. So yeah. So any of those tours are you a lance corporal? Because you mentioned that you got a no. Lance. That was after. That was after. That was okay. After. So all of those, you were a sapper, um, doing your job. Yeah. Oh no, actually, the second one I was a lance corporal. Just being promoted to lance corporal. That's why. I was okay. Troop, that's why I was troop commander's driver. Right. So as a bit as, more responsibility as a new lance corporal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then you come back and and then, as you mentioned earlier, you you kind of headed over to, to Germany. Yeah. So that was May nineteen ninety nine. So, uh, posted out to Germany to three five engineer regiment. Um, that was two nine squadron then. Right. Um. Got there and two days later I was off to Norway for three months for uh to work on a bridge refurbishment um apparently in the 60s the squadron had refurbished this old railway bridge it was right next to an army uh, norwegian army camp refurbished this railway bridge and turned it into a pedestrian bridge um and obviously over the period of time it was you know a bit of a decrepit state so it needed to be redone again, right? So, um, yeah, went over there three months, um, totally stripped the bridge, rebuilt the bridge, you know, 
really good tour. Really enjoyed Norway. And you get to see much of it, much of the country. We got to see quite a bit of it. Um, got quite a bit of adventure training done there, you know. And if anybody's ever been to Norway, you know, it's an adventure training paradise. Right. It really is, you know, because you got you got the rivers there for canoeing and whitewater rafting. You got mountains there to climb you know, an abseil down and all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, no, it was quite good. So we actually drove up there, right? So we drove up to Denmark, got on the ferry, drove up to this place where we we're going to be, right? And um, so we had one 14-tonner full of stores, you know, and all the, all the G10, all the equipment and stuff like that. And then we had another one, Squadron Bar, <laughs> <laughs> we're absolutely stocked up to the gills with uh booze and fags and god knows what you know uh so if you've ever been up to scandinavia um beer is very expensive okay right so i think at the time it was like um six or seven pound a pint i think it's probably like 12 pound a pint up there now you oh. know so really expensive right so we roll into town, lorry full of cheap beer. We instantly become everybody's friend, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> right? So that was quite good. Um, so we set up our own little squadron bar on the camp that we was in. Uh, all the Norwegians came up there. The adventure training guys used to come down to us as well for drinks and that on the weekend and all this sort of thing as well. And um, one, one Saturday night, the adventure training instructors challenged our troop commander. Um, I bet you haven't got the balls to put a team in for the Pepsi Max Extreme Week, white water raft, white, white water uh, raft race. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> so it was like eight volunteers, and I was one of them. Um, got to go up to do the Pepsi Max Extreme Week at a place called Voss. Um. Yeah, that was mad that week. Uh, we was <laughs> we literally had two hours practice on the local river where we were before we drove up there, and then not uh, two runs down the river that the competition was going to be on before right. the actual competition. <laughs> uh, all the other competitors are all professional kayakers or professional white water rafters. Really? Yeah, been doing it for <laughs> years. You know, I know all like you lot are crazy because this is literally a grade four slash five river that we're going down right um and they all thought we was absolutely mad total amateurs going into that competition you're all absolutely mad so the first the first day was just like a uh a slalom you know like you see on at the olympics and stuff so you have to go through gates and cross the river and go through gates and stuff on go back and forth all the way down and then the next day was just a mad straight race tight against the clock, right? But um, there were some big drops along that river. And um, on the practice day, there's like a big horseshoe one, right? And there's probably like a two-meter drop or something like that, two or three-meter drop. And then add another drop afterwards, straight afterwards, and then another drop straight afterwards. Only like a little, like a meter or so each, you know? but quite a lot of white water there. And it was literally pedal, paddle, uh, paddle, 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 go as fast as you can. And if we get out without being spat out of the boat, double thumbs up. <laughs> 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 so we had a proper guide on the back, right? Professional kayaker who was the guide on the back. So first time we go down, he's like, paddle, 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 paddle. It's all paddling like mad. Right, hold on. We go down this thing, and the next thing I know, I'm flying through the air like Superman. No right? way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still trying to hold on to the boat, but I'm just flying through the air like Superman with my paddle, hit, literally hitting everybody on the back. I was, I was back left. And um, literally knocking everyone out of the boat with my paddle. <laughs> but the other um, adventure training instructors were on, the, on this bridge, sort of, less than 100 meters down the river overlooking this drop and they said what happened was 
your raft, as soon as you went down there, there must not have been quite enough in the air in there because it literally folded in oh, half. No. <laughs> Spat everybody out and we're all having near near death experiences in this in the being tumbled in stoppers in the in the white water. And we must have all been in there like five or six seconds or something like that before being spat out felt a lot longer believe me um but apparently the instructor was the only one left on the boat and he was like we made it guys guys <laughs> guys he was the only one left on the boat oh, was, but yeah no that was really good fun um but yeah no norway's stunning place absolutely beautiful that's good that's good yeah um so we came back from that after finishing the bridge and handing that over um, and I went straight onto a search course in Chatham. Okay. Um, ready for uh, Northern Ireland tour. All right. Yeah. Doing yeah. Uh, Royal Engineers Specialist Search Team. So, excuse me. Um, so that was using uh, like ground penetrating radar and doing the swabbing for trace explosives and stuff like that um but back then nobody knew what ground penetrating radar was right so um apparently some of the ira caches they thought it was um they thought it was an x-ray machine or something like that so they dropped the caches up in lead right which actually made it even easier to spot yeah. with a ground penetrating radar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, if, you know, everyone knows what ground penetrating radar is now. You know, you see it on the TV with the archaeological digs and stuff like that, don't they? You know? Yeah. 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 That's, it's, it's that, really. You know, you're looking for voids in the ground and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but, yeah, no, that was quite good. Um, and then you head out to Northern Ireland. Yes. Right, not long after that course. Yes. Yeah. But... We finished that course, got back to Hamel, had to move down the road to Paderborn. Oh, you're moving camp beforehand? Yeah, because the regiment Daniel. had to move down the road to Paderborn. Right. Um, because two eights camp was closing, I think, and then you had to go into that one. I think I think that was the... So where, where was 3-5? Was it in Barker Barracks? That was, yeah, at Paderborn it in was. In Paderborn, okay. Yes. And then wh where was you... Wh what was the barracks called up in Hamel? Oh. Because two eight. When one, I went there, were called Gordon Barracks. One was Gordon Barracks, and Walden as well was down near that, the river. That that's was where that was the, the training that's where park, the, though, wasn't yeah. it? Um, that's where I think the it was Gordon. Were. I'm not entirely sure though. No, M memory's faded. <laughs> I think it was Gordon Barracks. Yeah, because I think two eight moved out of their barracks and moved into moved ours. into there. Okay, I could be wrong though. So I'm sure someone out there would tell us. The, the 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 front gate was like a big slider gate. It was a slow sliding gate. Yeah, but both camps had that. Did they? Have, oh, okay. <laughs> I see. I don't know. The, I don't know the other camp. See, I don't. I don't know the other camp. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, that does that doesn't narrow it down. But the, they were literally just around the corner from each other, though, weren't they? I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah, they were. They weren't far apart. Because when but, I when I got there, they we were literally handing it over. I think I went uh, there. I think I went there once just to pick someone up that oh, had been staggering on yeah um i'm sure it was called i never went I don't, I don't think i went in yeah like, as you drive in you've got the big parade square just to the left that's gordon that's gordon barracks yeah, yeah. was that where you were yeah and you had the cookhouse at the like the far end far end in front of you yeah and yes. you had the med center to the right so you had the yes. guard room to the right and behind the guard room was the med center that's it yeah, yeah. gordon barracks so that's where you were yeah. so you're right so yeah two yeah. eight moved in there because that's yeah. where i went yeah 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 cool there you there go, you go. There you go. Memory's not as bad as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so then you move everyone down to, well, you and your uh, your regiment move down to Paderborn, Paderborn yes. which is Barker Barracks. Yes. Um, you then literally drop your kit off and then have to head go out to, to Northern Ireland. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, literally. Yeah. So yeah so did you drive all your kit down then? Did yes. You, well, yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. when, when you say move, it was literally move all the equipment that you had. Yeah, yeah. Vehicles yeah. and everything. Like everything. That. Wow. Everything had to move down there. So, yeah. But thankfully, because I was off to Northern Ireland, I, I wasn't really involved too much in the move. Oh, okay. So it was moved my all my personal kit down there and get into a room. It was, yeah. 
It's okay. just you come back from that course on the Monday, drive down to Barker Barracks with all my kit on the Wednesday, and I think we was on the plane to Northern Ireland on the Friday or the Saturday. Right, right, but, right. Yeah, okay. You know, so it's, yeah. Cool. It's quite a quick turnaround. So that's, you know, even, a, you know, um, I don't think I spent that long actually actually in Hamel. You know, it's probably a couple, couple of weeks total that I was there, you know, just because straight out to Norway and then straight onto the course and then come back and then move down the road to Paderborn. But, um, but yeah, did you ever go to Paderborn when you was out there? Uh, yeah, that was my second posting. Oh, yes. So, my, yeah, my first posting was, was Hamel. Yes. Um, for five years. And then the f- second time was was three eight three five so oh brilliant so i did both oh okay <laughs> it's exactly what you did i did just later <laughs> yeah no fair enough fair enough um so yeah 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 i mean that that northern ireland tour was interesting um because it was a specialist search team we was in civis all the time oh you were yeah okay yeah, I, don't, I think i put uniform on twice in the whole how long was you out there about four months four I months think. yeah 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 and what yeah, was you doing in that months. So that's, undercover <laughs> well yeah so we you know we had these um a lot of our jobs were the testing for um trace amount of explosives down at the docks oh okay so we go down to one of the docks park up in our big massive transit van that we had um that was done up like a lab inside it was proper like you know, unbelievable um and then we go around and test lorries and trailers and, you know, vehicles and God knows what. Come back, test it. You know, if it, if there was a, if there was a, um, one came back as a positive test, then we just let the uh, controllers know and they'd let the RC, I, IUC know as it was back then. You know, um, but yeah, I think it was just sort of tracing where explosives were being moved around at the time, like the Semtex and stuff like right, that. The, okay. uh, you know, the IRA and Pyra were using for the bombs and stuff like that. So it's part of that. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. And then, you know, we do a couple of area searches and stuff as well. That's when we put the uniform on. Right. Ground penetrating radar and stuff like that. But, any um, any hairy moments whilst you're out there or the job um, you were doing it was fairly all right? We, we did have um, an area search. It wasn't really hairy, but... Um, area searching um, in South Armagh right on the border um, I think it was just to wind up really a couple of the protagonists out there um, I do remember being told oh that guy that's in that bungalow up there in his window watching us while we're going through his apple orchard we know he's a member of Pyra that sort of thing like oh, okay you know and it was an area where um a few years earlier there was a there was an ambush and pirates sort of killed quite a few uh, uh uh british military on patrol and right. stuff like that okay. so we knew it was a hot spot um did quite a few venue searches and stuff like that as well um because the peace talks were going on then so that was quite interesting um so yeah, that was quite interesting. Okay. You know. And then when you come back from there, are you what, what what's on the cards? Uh what happened after Northern Ireland? So that was back to Paderborn. Um Oh yeah. So that was sorry, my memory's just kicking in there. Uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah, that's I, I was uh made orderly corporal squadron orderly corporal yeah so set up in the sergeant major's office you know writing writing the daily orders and stuff that used to get posted up on the troop notice boards and stuff like that so i was doing that but i was also um given the job of squadron barman Uh, as well so that was that was quite good fun um not good fun getting the deliveries up to the squadron bar though because the squadron bars in Paderborn, if you remember at Barker Barracks, we're in the attics yep. of the blocks. Yep. <laughs> so, and there's no lift. And there's no lift. <laughs> um, and that's four floors up that you'd have to carry crates of beer up. 
and um, you get the odd volunteer here and there wanting to help you, but not many, you know. So the amount of times I've went up and down those stairs to 2-9 Squadron Bar, carrying crates of beer and bottles of vodka and God knows what, you know, to stop the bar up every week. That was a weekly occurrence, you know. So, But, yeah, no, I had some good nights in those bar, in that bar. You know, um, yeah, it's a good fun. Nice. Yeah. And then do you go away again or are you, are you getting posted somewhere? Um, from then, um, I was encouraged by my OC at the time to try the Clark of Works course. Okay. And for anybody that has uh, no idea what that is. So <laughs> so Clark of Works is the co-eds at Chatham, really. Um, and there's there's three different strings or three different types of Clark of Works uh, in, the, in the Royal Engineers. So you've got mechanical, you've got electrical, and you've got construction, right? Um, so construction's pretty obvious. Um, you know, that deals with construction tasks and all that. They oversee the bigger projects. The bigger projects. Yeah. Uh, electrical will focus more on the electrical part of a project, you know, electrical supply and all this sort of thing, and, and um, uh, installations and all that sort of stuff. Mechanical is um, <clears throat> more of the sort of the plumbing sort of side and the you know, air conditioning and heating and all that sort of, you know, all the ducting and all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, so that's the mechanical sort of side. They obviously do a lot more as well, you know. Um, <coughs> so I got encouraged to go on to that. Now, I've already told you I'm dyslexic, right? So <laughs> this is another dyslexic story coming up. So, um, okay, all right, I'll give that a go. I think I can. I think I can do that. And um, as part of you have to be selected to go on to the course, right? And as part of the selection, you have to go to Chatham um, in Kent for a few days for an interview process. So on the first day, you do like a maths test and an English test and some other tests. And then the next day, you have your interview in front of a board of like officers and senior NCOs, right? So you have um i think there was a colonel a major an smi um i think there might have been another major or something as well but um so board of four people and i'm sat there and uh i'm thinking oh the interview's going okay i thought it was all right um and then this colonel brings up my uh report for my trades class one course right um, which I did a couple of years previous, right, for my A1. And um, written by some colonel I've never even spoke to ever, right, uh, wrote a, the last line was, uh, Cool Stephen sometimes has difficulty in expressing himself in written exam conditions. I was like, I've never even seen this report, you know, I've never even seen this. And um, this colonel goes, why, why, why do you think that is, Corporal Stevens? And before I could think of a clever answer, out of my mouth came, probably because I'm dyslexic, sir. And his face. I'm pretty sure I could have got up, taken my trousers down, squatted on top of the desk, taken a dump in front of him, and he would have been less shocked. All right. He's, he was like, Okay, and then um, he asked me, I'll never forget this question, <laughs> are you sure you're dyslexic or are you just badly taught? Now, in a roundabout way, I know you're calling me thick there. You know, so I came out of that interview and went, there is no way I'm on that course. Not a cat in hell's chance I'm on that course. A week and a half later, I'm back in Paderborn. Joint instructions turn up. Really? I'm like, the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> how the how really? fucking hell did I get on that? So, 
I go and and this is like January time. The course starts in like January, and it's a two year course, a Clarker Works course. Right. Yeah. Um, and the first six months is the we're going to break you part of the course okay. sort of thing, right? Um, and it's they take you literally day one is like primary school maths. Two plus two equals, right? Excuse me. Right up until at six months, you're doing degree level maths. So you're doing things like the Plas theorem and all this sort of stuff, right? Which is maths without numbers. You know, it's just mind-boggling stuff, right? Um, and you also do physics as well, which is maths, but harder. Yeah. <laughs> um but i put a lot of effort into that six months a lot of effort because i wanted to do it right? i wanted to pass it um however i failed two exams and rtu'd straight back to unit you know because right. i failed two exams um but also that six months is a see if your face fits with the instructors yeah. type sort of affair yeah you know it's quite clark works sure they won't forgive me for this but it's quite a clicky little group you know in the core and you know <laughs> looking back on it sort of quite rightly so as well you know you've got to be highly trained highly motivated you know um and you've got to be very 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 clever to get through it and to be a clerk of works right you know um and if I, if I remember rightly if you pass it you come <coughs> out as a staff sergeant that's correct yeah. yes yeah so you come out as a staff sergeant yeah, when you yeah. finish it so okay. you can go on that course as a lance corporal and at the end of two years you come out as a staff sergeant mm. yeah yeah I, I just haven't heard of that terminology clerk works for about 10 plus years so yeah <laughs> yeah it's been a while so. yeah that's so, good to hear what they do though at the beginning of it um yeah yeah it's very intense you know um and if you've never seen that level of maths before, you know, because I, like I said, I never went on to college or university. I didn't do further education. And when I was at school, I was put in a lower group, you know, so I, most of the maths I was exposed to in that six months, I'd never seen before in my life. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, so like on the tests and stuff, it's like, you've not answered any of these questions. I said, well, I wouldn't, I've never seen it before, so I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even know how to bluff it, let alone put the right answer down, you know. But um, yeah, that was intense, hard work, but yeah, intense. Yeah. Um, wasn't to be, and I got sent back okay. to. Well, it, and because you post there, you know, you don't get RTU'd. You get asked, where do you want to be posted back to? Okay, you know, so. I asked to go back to Germany, back to three five. You did, right. So back to three five and um seven seven squadron this time. Um so I was in there as a like section two IC, combat engineer section two IC. Um and then Iraq really it's ugly Ed. But um before we went to Iraq, th there was a fireman strike back then just before the iraq war um oh yes yeah 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 um and we were supposed to start training for that right so we'd all been warned off like we're going to do training for to to do the fireman strike right okay and then it got cancelled just before christmas about november late november time that training got cancelled so everyone's thinking oh why is that why is that why is that and obviously, in the news, you know, you've got all the hands blick and all the weapon inspectors getting mucked around by Saddam, trying to track down his weapons of mass destruction and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? We're going to Iraq. No, 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 we're not. Right? Oh, yeah, I bet we are. We got sent on this big exercise sort of just outside Poland. Uh, not Poland. Um, um, no one Poland still Germany um but it was on a train area we'd never been for before right so it was in the east of Germany we went on this 
big exercise. And um, that was cold. <laughs> that was cold. East, Eastern Germany in December, one exercise in the back of a 432. No, no, no. Not <laughs> nice. Really cold. But it was good exercise, but it's pretty obvious that we was getting geared up for something, right? Um, and then we come back off Christmas Eve, hey, right? We're all off to Iraq, you know, for doing the invasion, right? So um, it was 2-9 squadron um, deployed to Iraq from 3-5, but it was pretty much... 60% of the regiment went, you know, so it was a big bolstered squadron okay. deployed on Telic 1, right, um, for the invasion. And we were supporting 2-8 Engineer Regiment. Right. Amphibious, right? Okay. So <clears throat> because 2-8's a brigade asset uh, for the amphibious crossings and stuff like that, you know, they kept well in the rear. So, because we were supporting them, we was well in the rear for, right. for the invasion. So, I think we actually crossed the border on uh, plus four. What, days or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been like plus three or four days after. From Q8 into, into from Iraq. From Q8 right. into Iraq. But we, we, we went out to Q8 um, early February. So we spent all that time living in a... Yeah, because it was March, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And the 23rd of March, was it? Was the actual fact? I can't remember the date because I, I'd just come back from Afghan. Oh, okay. So, um, yes, because that was kicked yeah. off at the same time, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So we, we sort of spent four or five weeks living in the desert in a harbour area, just on a flat desert like a billiard table flat it was you know um in shell scrapes in the back of out of the back of a 432 and then we crossed across the border um and then we was living in harbour areas for a couple of weeks sort of outside um as a buyer okay, okay. um and then eventually we got into shiber airfield and we built um a big tented camp on shy Brayfield. right 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 um yeah so you i mean you must have supported so 28 itself wasn't a amphibious regiment anymore so it was two three squadron that was amphibious. oh okay yes so i was part of four five which doesn't exist anymore yes um and so we were field support mm -hmm. so we we that's why we were in afghanistan as a squadron got you i'm guessing two three went out to um, Iraq, and that's why you're attached to them potentially. Yes, but I'm guessing. Yeah, I think they did. I think they did like one amphibious. I was going to say, did, crossing. did they do much out there? Because <laughs> they did one. <laughs> you know, um, 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 I mean, at that time before we got to Shiba, you know, um, yeah, we were so far behind everyone. We literally had to send our laundry forward. No, or, no, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or, or go forward to have a shower. Bloody hell! We were okay. that far behind everybody. So it was all it was all quiet by the time you got over the border. Yeah, I mean, um, there was a couple of times when we were in harbour areas, sort of you know outside Azerbaijan and stuff like that, where you'd see all that heavy helicopters flying over, you know, right. all the helicopter gunships and the jets flying over, and you see the artillery landing, and you see the all all off in the distance, right. you know. Um, so you'd see it all, but not close up, if you yeah, know what I mean. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It was so so far behind; it was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anything else happened once you got into Iraq that stands out? Um, not really. It was just, it was just we we got to Shiba Airfield and we just had to start building camps. Right. So, okay. um, did you did you ever go out? To Iraq? Uh, yeah, the following year. Yeah. So, so I went out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, same, same squadron. Yeah. Went out the, the, the January of 2004. Yeah. So did you, you, you did all that and did, it was Shiba. You, so if you remember, um, I, I think Shiba sort of become a bit of a Corrymeck city by the time you got there. But first yeah. of all, it was all literally thousands of 
12 by 12 tents, you know, put, and we had to put all those up. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I'm sure it was Shiba Log Base for the first one. And then what was the airfield? So it was a, that was the log base, wasn't it? And then there was an air, there was an airfield. Well, you, had, you had Cyber Airfield. It was an old airfield. It wasn't actually used as an airfield. Yeah, but we by called us. it log base, didn't we? Logistics uh, base. I think after a while we did. Yes. Right. That's when I yeah. went. When yeah. it was called that. Um, and, then, and then there was the big main and, airport. And you had the airport, didn't you, down the road? Yeah. Basra Airport. Mm. Yeah, because the Americans were on the Basra Airport. Yeah. Don't know. Don't, don't matter. Were they? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Or, I'm th- or am I thinking of Afghan? I think you're thinking of Afghan. Might be. There was yeah. Day, there was no, no, no. Yanks. Yeah, down I'm, thinking of, I'm thinking of Afghan. I'm thinking of yeah. Afghan. It's what happens when it's so long, isn't it? Doesn't it? Just yeah. Um, It'll stop blending into it one. Do, little it bit, do, it do. Yeah, because I'm just thinking of all the all the <coughs> big tall sangers they had. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's a different yeah. story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So log Shiba log base. Uh, yeah. When I got there, there was like a naffy built up and yeah, that kind of stuff yeah, had already yeah. been yeah put in place. So yeah. you were you were kind of like putting the foundations in for the camp to build upon and yeah yeah get so bigger. we built a regimental size tented camp um, for people to live in but um there was I think there was about two or three went in that size um, in Shiba um, if you remember where the air the 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 um the runways were and then you had the space in between that's where we put the tented camps in yeah. between yeah. Um, and like the naffy was a bit further at the end, wasn't it? And you had like Gundolf, was it Gundolf lines? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's all coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that now. Yeah. Um. Um. But there was a big like uh, water um, place there, which I remember we painted the piper, the two nine piper on. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And then over the road, actually. Um. We had that's when um, Burger King turned up and KFC turned up over the road. <laughs> Never seen so many people turn up to queue for hours, literally hours and hours and hours to get a burger. It was unbelievable. But then again, we've all been living on MREs for the last two months. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So a bit of not quite fresh food, is it? But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's better. It's something, better. Something different from an MRE, yeah. the same boring MRE, yeah. you know. Or rations. 